are listening to the Fiddler's Forum with American violinist Alex Depew. Today, Depew discusses musical counterpart Miguel de Hoyos from Monterrey, Mexico, a virtuoso flamenco guitarist. With de Hoyos, the duo has performed all over the world, including the 2016 Summer Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. Today we will include the entire interview with music critic George Varga of the San Diego Union Tribune. It is with exclusive permission from the San Diego Union Tribune that we're able to bring you this broadcast today along with live interviews with both Alex and Miguel as well as some live performances from the duo. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for being with us at the Fiddler's Forum. Welcome to Fill in the Blank with George Varga, San Diego Union Tribune's pop music critic and a regular contributor to the website utstreet.com. Each week, Fill in the Blank will feature a San Diego artist who will talk about their work and what inspires them to create. You can call in with questions and comments at 866-818. Here's George Varga. Get ready to fill in the blank. Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Fill in the Blank. Uh, I'm particularly honored today to have not one, but two very, very gifted musicians uh, to perform for you and talk to you. Uh, violinist Alex DePew and uh, guitarist Miguel De Hoyos. And uh, they have a brand new album out called Underground Whispers. And uh, they're going to open up uh, the program today by playing a number for you from that album. What number are you going to play today, Miguel, to begin with? Uh, actually, it will be the number one track on the, on the CD, Underground Whispers. And it's an original composition that we perfectioned last uh, year. And we got it recorded this year. It's, uh, I wrote the song a few years ago, but I found Alex a perfect, a perfect uh, partner to play the song because it's it's quite demanding. Uh -huh. It's entitled Cortijo, is that correct? The, the complete number name is Cortijo de Alcala, but we call it Cortijo for for like a short name. And what would the complete translation be of the full title? Okay, Cortijo. It's a it's a training bullring. Mm -hmm. where the, the, the bullfighters go to train before they go to the big plaza. Cortijo is a small one that usually is in a ranch of the men that that grows the bulls for the fighting. Mm -hmm. It's like, they call it ganaderia, when they have those those bulls that are going to fight. Okay, there is a training a training bull ring for both, either the, the bullfighters mm -hmm. and also the animals. They learn how to, how to, to fight. So are you the matador and Alex is the bull, or...? <laughs> <laughs> no, not exactly. But this, this song came out uh, when uh, I was playing a concert in a place called Ajusco in Mexico State, mm -hmm. like 12 years ago, and it was about that, because there was a big, a big fiesta of bullfighting, and, and all the matadores were there in that fiesta, and I was playing for them. And then... I was playing with another band, which uh, is, is not together anymore. It's called La Guitarra por el Mundo. We were playing together, and that night we come up with this song. I wrote the song, and then I tell, I'll tell everybody, okay, this is the song, this is how it goes. So we performed it that night for the first time. And I named it after the place. The, mm -hmm. the place we were at, it was El Cortijo de Alcala. All right, well, without further ado, Alex de Pew and Miguel de Hoyas doing Cortijo. Thank you. 
Wow. Cortillo. It's early, it's early George. <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> what an opening number. Uh, Alex Depew, Miguel de Hoyos uh, performing Cortillo on Fill in the Blank, the opening cut from their new album, Underground Whispers. Um, a lot of my favorite music uh, has a quality where you can't really tell where the arrangement ends and the improvisation begins and where the improvisation ends and the arrangement resumes. And that was a perfect example for me of that. Um, talk about how easy or difficult it was to to ob obtain that quality in your playing as a duo. As a duo? Hmm. Well, things happen kind of magically between the two of us. When we first played together about a year and a half ago or so, uh, it didn't take very many notes to figure out that this was a, a match made uh, in a musical heaven, so to speak. Uh, we kind of follow each other's uh, leads as far as dynamics and as far as uh, arrangements as well. So uh, to answer your question, um, a lot of it is improv, but after you, you perform the same selection so many times, uh, sometimes your improv uh, for the for the sake of laziness, uh, even sometimes mm -hmm. turns into the actual arrangement, and you, you don't see many reasons to to vary from what you had originally improvised. Am I making sense? You are okay. And yet, I take it it wouldn't be note for note every time you play it. No, no, certainly not, and definitely with the, it depends on the song. You know, when we do autumn leaves or a couple jazz standards, you know, throughout the course of our show. Uh, that those will certainly change on a nightly basis. Now, you got together about a year and a half ago. Uh, when and how did the two of you team up? Well, it was... Uh, we, we actually met, like, yeah, a year and a half, almost two years ago. Where? In, back in Baja, Baja North, about uh, between Rosarito Beach and Ensenada. There is a little place down there. And I was working there by that time, and then Alex was there with his cousin, and his cousin introduced me to Alex. He says, this is my cousin. He plays fiddle. He's a great fiddle player. And I, I got to say the truth, I was not interested because I, <laughs> you know, I've been introduced to many musicians all the time and so forth. But and the last thing, I'm sorry to interject, but the last thing a musician wants at the end of the gig is to get the guitar back out. And have an unknown guy come up. And some <laughs> kid's going to, you know, punk kid's going to play the fiddle. <laughs> yeah, but actually the thing is, okay, finally we, I said, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. So we did it. What did you perform? Uh, it's, it's, it's a story. It's because first time you ever met someone, another musician, and said, okay, let's play something that everybody in the, in the world knows. Mm -hmm. Let's play Besame Mucho. Okay, let's play Besame Mucho. And say, what key? Whatever key. When a musician says whatever key is is that he knows his instrument, so he can play in any key. Then after that, I start playing, okay, this is... A and then he started... I said, okay, this guy really can play the violin. So we kept playing the song, we finally, finally finished the song. I sang it, and he was playing the, the lick. After that song, we play another song, First time for everything. Mm -hmm. By the third song, I said, Alex, can you play something by yourself? So he start playing, and he just blew me away. He says, he is the greatest violinist I have ever seen that close, you know, sitting next there. Immediately, I thought, we need to do something. But then he got really busy with Steve Vai. That's right, you did a world tour with uh, Steve Vai? That's correct, yeah. Uh, still so that recovering. You, right. <laughs> so that meant you had to postpone working together? Yeah, then uh, all of a sudden, uh, the end of the last year, he shoot me an email from Brazil. He was in Brazil or Argentina, I don't know where, saying, my tour with Steve I is about to finish. Let's do something. I said, perfect. I'm going to be in Cabo San Lucas for some time if you want to meet me over there. Mm -hmm. so, Try it a couple weeks if you like it. And those couple of weeks became three and a half months, so he didn't want to come back more. Yeah, that wasn't a very difficult decision. So th was that like a vacation that turned into a musical thing? or The, the plan, and he's been doing this uh, on an annual basis, but he goes down there to, to work. Mm -hmm. And I just went along for the ride, and we'd work we did. So we're going to do it again. You and, know, and it's beautiful. At the end of that three and a half month period, did you pretty well have everything together for the album, or not quite? or? Yeah. The answer to that is yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. We were ready to ready to rock by the time we got back. 
here to uh, yeah actually as as soon as uh, after those three months we spent over when we get back first thing we did we was to find a studio and start recording mm -hmm. right now we're thinking about we are just getting finished with the material for the second recording that we will probably be on the on the oven next year beginning next year sometime um, you're both very eclectic you you can play uh, a, a wide variety of different musical styles, um, rock, flamenco, blues, jazz, you know, the list goes on and on. But correct me if I'm wrong, though, maybe one common denominator that both of you from a very young age have is classical music. Is that accurate for both of you? Yes, I... I Absolutely. I did went to the school of music. In Monterey? Or? In Monterey, Mexico, yeah. I was 13 years old when I was at the college so studying music. Miguel, first you and then Alex, what does having a foundation in classical music bring to your work now as a duo? What what does it enable you to do? Well, that's a good question. What is what it does to you, Alex? <laughs> uh, it, it, number one, for a violinist, uh, having been trained classically, uh, is a bit different from the norm in the fiddle world mm -hmm. because most uh, improvisationalists on the violin or slash fiddle are not classically trained and basically what I find it brings to the table is a set of chops you know as opposed to to uh, some sometimes uh, fiddle players play a lot out of tune and classical musicians are not allowed to do that that's a big problem good point <laughs> No frets on a fiddle, so yeah. you got to be careful. So you referred to uh, another album that you hope to, to be doing in the near future. Might there be a classical piece on, on that album, or when you perform live, do you have any classical repertoire? Well, we'll be probably be very eclectic, like this one, Underground Whispers is. Underground Whispers has original music from both of us, and it has other arrangements of music from another great artist that we we know and like for so many years and you can in that tape in that cd you can hear uh you well know, there's the tchaikovsky violin concerto we threw that in there in, in, in my part. my song there <laughs> right <laughs> um if people want to get underground whispers and i would highly recommend that they do that and i'd point out that uh the album does indeed contain original material by both of you and very striking covers of of uh Black Magic Woman, which uh, Fleetwood Mac first recorded and Santana had the big hit with. Uh, Black Orpheus, Autumn Leaves, Stairway to Heaven, uh, La Bamba. Um, how, how can people obtain the album? What would be the easiest way? Well, if you're like me, you like the hard copy mm -hmm. of, of a CD or a record or an LP or a tape because, you know, this digital thing doesn't provide the artwork, really. I mean, I think there are some programs that you can download along with your iTunes order, but... Not the same thing. Yeah, it's really not the same thing, and I like to be able to have something that I can hold and look at and listen to, uh, uh, read while I'm listening. So, uh, if you're interested in getting the, the hard copy, we will send that to you in four to six weeks, and you can order that at depuedeoyas.com. That's D-E-P-U-E D-E-H-O-Y-O-S Dot com uh, also is available on iTunes as well. So. Okay. Can people download it uh, off your website or would they go to iTunes to, to do that? I think they go to iTunes. Uh, okay. Um, you've got an upcoming gig at Lestat's, I believe. Uh, what would the date for that be? Uh, Lestat's? Do you know? November 26th. November 26th. Okay. <laughs> yes, neither. Wow, okay, so now it's all coming back to me. We're going to do Lestat's on the 26th, and then we're going to continue heading up north for an, another performance at a wonderful little venue. I, I wanted to mention this on oh, here. It's called uh, the Coffee Gallery, and it's run by Bob Stain, and that's in Altadena, California, just outside of L.A. Plenty of milk there, I would hope. I'm sorry? Plenty of milk. Does Altadena have a famous... Yeah, uh, I haven't been I haven't <laughs> been in Southern California long enough to answer that question. There is one more performance you yeah. allow me. It's going to be on, on November nineteenth uh -huh. at Carlsbad High School. Uh, 
It's a uh, every year they do like a benefit thing to raise money for buying com things for the school, uh -huh. and then we're going to be performing there on November 19th, Carlsbad High School. I believe that the doors will be open at 6:30, and the concert is at 7. Okay. I would think if people logged on to the website for Carlsbad High School, they could hopefully find out more information about yeah. that. And about Lestat's, a big, big shout out to Lou over there at Lestat's. Hi, yeah, Lou. great, great venue in Normal Heights and uh, all ages. You can take your kids. Um, question for both of you, um, and we'll begin with you, Miguel. How old were you when you first picked up the guitar, and what inspired you to pick up the guitar? Well, uh, it's a it's a nice question. I was 11 years old when I took for the first time a guitar in my hands, with the intention of learn it, because my dad plays guitar. He's still alive, and he plays plays guitar. And as we were kids, I mean, three, four, five years old, mm -hmm. he play the guitar every day at home. Every day he was playing the guitar, every day, every day. And he was trying to get us interested in it, but we probably were more as a child to play with other things but a guitar. When I was 11 years old, I, my brother has to move to another city to, to study something, and then while he was gone, He learned a little bit of guitar when he get back home that that Christmas. Mm -hmm. He started playing with my dad, and they start playing together. I was 11 years old, watching my brother playing with my dad, like if they were playing the whole life. When my my brother was gone, I went to my dad and says, "I want to learn." He says, "I've been trying to teach you since the last five years, but <laughs> it's a good thing that you are interested." Then I started at 11. I want to I want to say this also. From age 11 to age 15, the motto proprio, I mean, because I like it, I love it, I practice like six hours a day. My fortune was, back in 1971, there was no internet, no PlayStation, no those right. those video games that gets all the kids uh, interested right. in other right. stuff. There was no cable TV, there was just read a book, play your instrument, play a sport, or do nothing. So I choose to play music. And make no money. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Alex, you, you came from a big musical family, if I recall. Yes, I do. Um, was it kind of in the blood, if you will, that you were going to play, or how, how did you get Yeah, you know, uh, my dad was not unlike Hitler. And, and even, <laughs> in a good way, we hope. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, was very demanding as far as practice and, and so forth. So uh, we, we really didn't have a whole lot of choice, even though he disguised it as though we did have a choice. Sure, you don't have to practice, but you, you'll have to, to mow the yard all night. Right. You know, or something, some just awful co consequences. So if how practice. old were you then when you got into violin? Well, I was five years old when, when I started, and uh, my older brother started the way for me, and I saw that he was getting blue ribbons, and girls were starting to come around, and <laughs> you know, that all looked very enticing. Let well, me get this right. At the age of five, you already wanted to get into girls. <laughs> <laughs> well, this d developed, you know, fiddle contest right. and so forth. Um, and uh, you, we touched upon this a while ago, but, but you kind of have the unique uh, dual background of being classically trained, but also having played in fiddle contests, and normally those are kind of like two different worlds, and, and you were coming up in both at the same time. Um, as a kid, did you even look at it that these are two different things and I'm in both of them, or did they seem like part of one whole for you? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, y you know, it, it was, uh, well, it was definitely separated. You know, the season of formal schooling on the instrument would happen during school months. And uh, then the summer summertime would come, and we'd pitch a tent and head out to little festivals and fiddle contests in the Midwest, Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and uh, and spend our summers like that, and and make friends and learn how to fiddle and and uh, improvise. Um, and at any point did anybody in one world or the other that is that a classical musician say wow how do you improvise like that or did a fiddler go wow how do you play so uh, 
you know, with that kind of structure. And, it, it, you know, is, did anyone comment at any point in a way that made you think, hey, these are two different things, even if I haven't thought of it that way? It was it was pretty evident that these were completely different styles of, of uh, violining, if for no other reason, because my, my teachers weren't really fond of the fact that we were improvising and fiddling. And they thought that it might... Uh, uh, D destroy the the formal approach to the instrument and if you're not careful it might mm -hmm. but if you are careful and you employ the same approach to the instrument that you use for classical music to the other side uh, for fiddling and contest fiddling and improvisation wow you've really got something unique there because once again in the fiddle world classical chops are really not common right and the irony of course is that up until the beginning of the 20th century, it was, it was pretty well mandatory for classical musicians to be able to improvise. And I've never quite figured out if there's any way of the magic wand, but somewhere in the early 20th century, that just evaporated, and, and you no longer were required to or wanted to improvise as a classical musician, which I think is really a shame, because if you look at, Agreed. at Bach and Mozart and all the great classical composers, they definitely improvised. Agreed, yeah. Yeah. Basso continuo. Mm -hmm. Those are just chordal structures, and, and they, uh, you know, today's transcripts have those arpeggiated and written out note for note, but I highly doubt that those parts were ever written back then. They just followed, a, just like we do on the guitar and, right. and chordal instruments. You're listening to Fill in the Blank. Our guests today are violinist Alex Depew and guitarist Miguel De Hoyos, who are... Uh, uh, going to perform later in the program again and have a terrific new album out called Underground Whispers. Um, the variety of material on your album is quite diverse. You go from the great jazz standard Autumn Leaves and uh, La Bamba to your own music to uh, very distinctive arrangements of, of music by, uh, by Billy Joel, uh, The Stranger, uh, The Eagles, Hotel California, Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. In picking material by other artists, Miguel, what was the criteria that you uh, you and Alex applied? Well, it's uh, right now we're working in different arrangements of of new songs that we are getting together for for our new CD whenever we get it, get it ready. And it, this is going to be also a very eclectic because right now we are picking a song to, which is from a Mexican composer Ruben, Ruben Fuentes. It's a song which is originally born for mariachi band mm -hmm. and we're doing this arrangement special for guitar and violin and in my opinion it sounded really great uh, what we're trying to find in here is the is the richness of how can two instruments can fill like you would say fill fill the blank uh -huh. there was no space left is is everything is covered we're, we're working also with uh, Mason Williams, uh, one of his creations, uh, uh, classical gas. Mm -hmm. Those are demanding music, the, uh, musically demanding songs. You have to be very accurate. It's like playing a classical song, but it's not classical. Right. And it, it demands the skills that you learned at the school of classical music demands those skills to be able to play those songs and but they are still still pop music is popular music that you can hear everywhere here and there or right little local trivia mason williams back in the 1960s was stationed in san diego in the navy and then when he got out of the navy he recorded classical gas and went on to uh, to fame and fortune um given the variety of different music uh idioms that the two of you perform together. Alex, I'm wondering, do you have a target audience, or is it really anyone and everyone? It really is anyone and everyone. You know, this is one of the few acts that's alive and well today where you can... It's There's something for everybody. I mean, from from the young kids are, are really enjoying these arrangements of, of the old great rock anthems, and we chose those for a reason. You know, the, you can't get enough Stairway to Heaven. We all know that. <laughs> and uh, uh, Dust in the Wind and uh, Hotel California. So, um, what was the question? Uh, <laughs> who was your intended audience? And you pretty oh, well covered it anyway. Yeah, everybody. 
eclectic audience. Uh, we're, we're trying to, to appeal a little bit more to the younger kids. Right. Um, you know. We're going to be back after a news break with more fill in the blank from Alex DePew and Miguel De Hoyos. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Fill in the Blank. I'm George Varga, the pop music critic for the Union Tribune, a frequent contributor to the website utstreet.com, and an aspiring pickpocket, but not doing too well there. <laughs> Our guests today on Fill in the Blank are uh, the great violinist Alex DePew and his equally gifted guitar playing partner Miguel De Hoyos. Again, thank you both for being here today. It's a pleasure. Sure. Um, you will next be able to hear them perform in San Diego November 19th at, was it Carlsbad High School? Carlsbad High School. And November 20th at Lestat's in uh, Normal Heights. And uh, depending where you live, I would highly, highly recommend you to get to either or both if you can. You hear terrific music uh, from their new album, Underground Whispers, which you can get by going to their website, www.depuedehoyos.com, D-E-P-U-E-D-E-H-O-Y-O-S.com, uh, or going to iTunes, and you will hear a wonderful variety of music performed at a really uh, impeccable level of musicianship. Um, I asked both Alex and uh, Miguel to bring in uh, a track or two by artists that they have been inspired by over the years. Um, and Miguel picked uh, Paco de Lucia, the great flamenco guitarist. Uh, regrettably, um, we don't have a recording available by Paco, uh, so we'll go instead to uh, Bobby McFerrin, the wonderful a cappella singer uh, who... Uh, only ever had one hit, but the great music before and after. That hit, of course, is Don't Worry, Be Happy. And uh, we're going to hear Blackbird by Bobby McFerrin. And Alex, I'm kind of intrigued that you, as a violinist, would pick a vocalist as a, a big inspiration. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? My father's uh, best friend growing up was the, the conductor of the choral program at Bowling Green State University. My dad is also a full professor at that same school, so... That uh, choral music has always been a major part of my life, and I've even coached uh, quartets and been involved with some singing groups mm -hmm. myself. But as a violinist, we never get to sing, and uh, I'm a little bit envious, frankly. And the the, the way that I, I really like to relax and get away from, from work is to listen to, to fine vocal groups like... like uh, well, like the King Singers, like mm -hmm. Manhattan Transfer, like uh, Take Six. Right, Max and Q. Max Q is a, a brand new barbershop quartet, and the, they may actually... Be, well, they're the international ch champions right now, and two of those guys are from Bowling Green State University. How about that? So we have quite a... We, we can brag all day long about the choral program there in, in uh, Bowling Green. And I thought Blackbird by... Well, Bobby McFerrin's version was interesting in that... Uh, it is, of course, the Paul McCartney Penn Beatles classic, yeah. and yet uh, on his last few tours when McCartney played it, he talked about how he was particularly inspired by Bach and, and Bach's Boré and played the guitar parts to both to show how Blackbird was inspired by Boré, and so the fact that both of you have a classical background kind of ties all of that in mm -hmm. together. Uh, without further ado, why don't we hear Blackbird by Bobby McFerrin? Yeah, Blackbird by Bobby McFerrin. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Boom, 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 boom. Take this broken wings and learn to fly. Boom, 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 for your life. Boom, 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 that you were only waiting for this moment to arrive. Beep, beep, beep. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. <laughs> Ding ding song in my eyes and learn to sing Ding ding ba doom Um ba doom all your life Um um do doom Um do doom We're only waiting for this moment to be afraid Beep 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 doo doo blah A heck burr her her fly Um boom 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 doo boom doo boom boom blah A heck burr her 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 fly Um boom boom doo doo Yeah to the light of the dark black night Baby, bang, bang, 
birds singing in the dead of night. Big days, broken wings, I learned to fly. Bobby McFerrin on Fill in the Blank, uh, selected for you by Alex Capu. Um, Alex, you've worked uh, with uh, Chris Cagle, the country star, and we alluded earlier to the fact that you did an, uh, a world tour with uh, Steve Vai, the uh, virtuoso guitarist uh, who first came to the fore, I think as a teenager, by before he even performed with Frank Zappa, by transcribing Zappa's incredibly difficult music, then becoming his, quote, <laughs> stunt guitarist, yeah. um, and then going on to work uh, with uh, a wide array of people from, uh, from David Lee Roth on, uh, and of course doing many solo albums on his own. Um, talk about working with uh, Steve Vai, and I would like to point out to people that if they go online, they can see a pretty jaw-dropping video of you and uh, Steve Vai going head-to-head. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, Steve is just a, a wonderful technician, and he's very precise and very uh, uh, particular about what is going to be played on his show. So uh, this particular tour was what we were introduced to a a stack of manuscript paper that we had not only had to learn, but we had to memorize. And, we and I, I recall from an earlier interview that uh, he really worked you hard in the rehearsal truly. portion. Yeah, he sure did. Uh, it was it was about 30 days. In, I mean, the, the rehearsal time was longer than the European leg of the tour, which was what we were preparing for. So... Um, yeah, and we'd finish the day after a 12-hour rehearsal, and he'd, he'd hand me another stack <laughs> of music to learn, and he'd look me in the eyeball and say, so you'll have that by tomorrow, right? <laughs> but when Steve Vai says that to you, he gives you the same look that he gave Ralph Macchio in the movie Crossroads, <laughs> and you're not going to say no. Uh, you know, I, yes, sir. Right. I'll have that for you first thing tomorrow, sir. And, you know, little things that he's, he's uh, particular about, like uh, I have to match him note for note uh, for a lot of the show, a lot of the, the um, uh, passages within his songs. And if he, it's not just enough to learn the notes. Like if he slides into a note, well, darn it, you're going to have to slide too. <laughs> So you might have to change your entire fingering pattern and your bowings or whatnot to accommodate that, but mm -hmm. you will m make it happen. Meaning that beyond listening very attentively, you have to visually pay a lot of attention as well? or You can hear what what's happening, but uh, sometimes when you're learning so much material in such a short amount of time, you might look over some of the intricacies that are involved with, especially with Vise music, and... Um, you know, we, we don't want to let that happen. <laughs> every note, he pays attention to every note. Now, I'm assuming he didn't do what Frank Zappa did, which is that Frank had a, a series of visual cues, like a 
Uh, if he tugged on his hair one way, it meant you immediately went into a reggae beat. If he tugged on his hair another way, did I'm assuming that Steve Vai did not have visual cues like that. No, no. It's a very well thought out, well planned production, and it's uh, basically what you would expect from Vi. It's a freak show, and uh, the live DV DVD of our Minneapolis show from the U.S. leg of the tour ought to be released sometime in 2009. Right, and you did perform here, I believe, a year ago, September, at Viejas, if yeah. I'm correct? Yep. Great well, night. Obvious question, but after doing the world tour with uh, Steve Vai, how was your hearing? How was my hearing? Uh-huh. Well, that's another good question, because uh, our our bassist, Brian Beller, bless his heart... Who plays with Mike Keneally, a great San Diego guitar player as well. Yes. Uh, has a, a, a bass cabinet called the Megaliath. <laughs> And I'm my placement on the stage is right next to him. So basically, I had 16 10-inch speakers aimed directly at my face. Wonderful for the entire tour. And <laughs> did, did that make an enduring impact on you, or I I would only complain just for a second, and then Brian is so good uh -huh. that y you just have to overlook the you know he's so good. Now, Miguel, I'm curious. Um, have you always played acoustic guitar, or did you ever play electric? Uh, as I was growing up, and uh, my so my my brother, he used to play gu electric guitar, and he used to use the pick to play his music. He pl he likes to play rock and roll and and, and, and that music. And I I am two years younger than he is. It's only two years difference, and it was some sort of a challenge for me to say, I will play this that he cannot play. Uh -huh. This meaning is a song where I can play bass, harmony, and melody at the same time. And if you use a pick, it's very hard to do it. You can you can develop a lot of speed, but it's almost impossible to play a song that has bass, harmony, and, and melody at the same time. So I, very early time, I went for the acoustic nylon string and classical style guitar so i learned how to, i develop how to play three things at the same time melody mm -hmm. harmony and, and and bass all together and it was not exactly a competition but it was like saying okay i can play this but you cannot play that then he played things that i could not play but then i said well but i played this what about that and then he comes up with something else, and then it was like, uh, it's not, we're going to play the same song and I'm going to be better than you. Right. Is I play this, but you cannot. Okay, but I play this, but you cannot. And that reminds it, me of my brothers. and It was some sort of a competition, but it's not exactly on the same thing. But it was b beneficial for both of us, because he developed his skills, I developed mine. He never became. He has never become a, a professional musician. He's an engineer. He does other things, mm -hmm. and I am the only one that in my family that became a, a professional musician. Even though my family is also a music family, uh, they, we play music for fun every end of the year when we get together in the holidays. We have parties. We sing and play and all that. We are talking to Miguel de Hoyos and Alex de Pew on Fill in the Blank uh, about their music uh, that they make together uh, live and on record. Their new album, Underground Whispers, is now available. Uh, again, they're going to be performing August 19th at Carlsbad High School at a fundraising concert, August 20th at La Stats in um, Normal Heights. Um, we have 10 minutes left on the program. If you want to call in and make a comment or ask a question, we invite you to do that. Our convenient toll-free number is 866-818-6384. Um, given that you are the only two people up there performing, how easy or difficult is it for you to surprise each other during a performance, and how important or not is it to surprise each other during a performance? You want to take that one? <laughs> Go ahead. 
Uh, you know, so, some some performances, and I think this is true with any group, any act, uh, are more inspired than others. And last night was a really good example of one of those magic nights. Where were you last night? We were basically at our home in Mexico, which is La Palapa de Ose. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little restaurant down there. It's just a wonderful time, and that's basically where you can find Miguel and I uh, almost every weekend, at least up until the, the first of the year. Well, is that the place near Rosarito? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, that's, it's only 60 kilometers south of the border. It's 45 miles That's south important to note, San Diegans. It's really <laughs> not that far, and I can guarantee you all a good time down there in Mexico. And you play there every weekend? or what? Yeah. Uh, for the most part, we have a couple shows for, for uh, state universities up in Ohio, uh, we're doing a little run in Ohio in November, mm -hmm. but we'll be back and then uh, uh, for a few more weeks before we go to Cabo. And people mm -hmm. can go on your website to find yeah, out exactly. Schedules are updated out. every day thanks to this gentleman here, Chris Richards. And how long uh, will the two of you be playing in Cabo, roughly? Usually, I, I was doing this this trips before Alex Alex came in the 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 do it. I've been doing this for five years, and usually I spend. Two, like probably three, three and a half months down there because it's beautiful weather, and I'm just like migrating like the birds, you know, I'll go south in the winter, mm -hmm. <laughs> back and back north in the summer. Smart way to do it. It's gorgeous down there. Yeah, truly. So it could it could last for either two and a half to to three and a half months could happen. Looking ahead, um, you've got uh, a really impressive debut album, Underground Whispers Out. You already uh, at work on a, a follow-up album. Uh, looking down the road, what do the two of you hope to accomplish as a uh, duo? Well, we'd like to rule the world, <laughs> George. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I hope we have the same... The same. The same idea on this, but uh, ultimately, what I see happening is, uh, you know, doing uh, performances that are, are more uh, educational. Sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, that's just one area that we could branch into and do these these uh, universities and colleges and high schools and so forth. But ideally, you know, Lincoln Center doesn't sound so, so bad. Not at all. Uh, Carnegie Hall. Philadelphia, we've already done a little something at Verizon Hall there with, uh, in conjunction with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to introduce Miguel to that scene quite yet, but working we're on working it. on that, sure. Yeah, and in my side, I've been going to Europe, to Germany specifically, to play concerts since 19... pardon, 2003. I go and play concerts in Germany every other year, and I have a little tour over there, and I'm I did have a tour last year in, in May, mm -hmm. played 19 concerts in 21 days. That wow. was crazy. 20, 19 concerts in 19 cities. Were you driving or going by train? We were or? driving around in the Autobahn, no speed limit. That's right. 5,600 5, uh, kilometers, which is kilometers to measure in there. It's around 4,000 miles and only in 21 days. This year, it's not, but 2009, I have another tour throughout uh, Germany, and I wanted to get Alex involved in that one. I still, to see what is going to happen to that one, but usually, it's what it's been. The concerts, tours in, in Europe, Germany, Czech Republic, Holland, Romania, those places, music is, our kind of music is very well received. It doesn't mean that it's not well received here. But it is. It has a special place mm -hmm. in those in those countries, which are well, very musical. I, I I hesitate before I say this, but uh, it, it is a fact, you know, that that uh, in the U.S. I'm afraid it, musicians don't quite get the the same level of respect that they do in every other country in the world. <laughs> I have to agree. I grew up in Germany and lived there 11 years, and I, I can confirm. So it's precious, he does. Yeah. <laughs> um, in Europe, you know, if you're carrying a fiddle case, you almost get approached uh, by people as though with the same respect that they would show a doctor. Well, you know? one of, to my mind, one of the, the most talented contrabassists in the world is Mark Dresser, who now hey. teaches at UCSD, 
And I remember an interview I did with Mark 20 years ago, huh. and he had just had a, uh, a Fulbright scholarship, I believe, to study in Rome with the great classical contrabassist. And I remember Mark telling me that when he got to Rome, it was the first time he had ever been rented an apartment because he was a musician. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Our guests today on Fill in the Blank have been uh, the violinist Alex De Pew and his guitar playing partner Miguel De Hoyos. Um, I would urge you all to go out and get a copy of their debut album, Underground Whispers. Do you want to play I will repeat that uh, they're performing on November 19th at Carlsbad High School at an All Ages Benefit concert, and the following night on November 20th at Les Stats and Normal Heights, also an All Ages venue. Uh, very happily, they're going to conclude with another live performance here in our studio. Uh, of a song featured on their album, but done in a way that I guarantee you you have not heard done before. And correct me if I'm wrong, you're going to be doing The Stranger by Billy Joel. Is that what you wanted to do? Well, thank you both for being here. Tune in again next week at 11.30 to fill in the blank. Thank you very much.
listening to the Fiddler's Forum with American violinist Alex DePew. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for being with us at the Fiddler's Forum.